thanks everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to talk to our talk to our peers. I've learned uh, quite a few things from a number of you. So, you know, and it's more of a I would call this more of an exercise of not Billy telling you what goes on, it's more Bill sharing with you kind of what he's learned from you over the years and, apply, and applied over the years. So it's more a case of sharing. And, and we may have an opportunity in terms of having questions go back and forth, hopefully, to kind of share back and forth with the experience. So, so let's. Uh, Let's figure out how to make this work first. So, so before we get started on the topic, I want to talk a little bit about speakers and so on. There's been a lot of speakers today, a real opportunity. You're going to get a chance later on to look at some of the videos that have recorded of the different speakers as well. So real opportunity, a lot of great speakers. Often people are speaking from their personal experience, uh, like, like I am, you know, and we can indeed learn a lot from each other. Uh, this slide kind of cues me to, to, to talk about one of my favorite maple producers. Um, so a number of years ago, um, one of my, sort of one of the people I really enjoyed listening to because he's very knowledgeable, a surf producer from the States. Um, we traveled down to Erie, Pennsylvania to listen to him. Uh, he was, he had expanded his operation and uh, he was topping tens of thousands of trees and he had went to um, high, high bricks and then an evaporator with, uh, I think there were like two seven foot wide, like 20 foot evaporators and so on. and. Uh, and the talk we went to listen to was talking about the flavor and how that flavor um, sort of mimicked what his grandfather did and so on. So it was very, a lot of build up and I tasted the serpent, and it was great. And I thought, you know, on the way home I'm saying, Lord, you know, he's got, talking about the flat pan and everything. It's like, we use steam, but that sure tastes a lot like we, you know, sort of like what we produce with steam. We're at the opposite end. We're high pressure steam, we're fast, get it through versus uh, slow it down and a big pan and so on. It was interesting, you know, but he was very passionate this was the way to do it. Two years later, he went to high pressure steam. So, you know, complete flip the other way. So, so I share that story with you because, you know, when you listen to me speak or anyone speak, you have to kind of recognize sort of the personal experience they're coming from, and they may move on and, and gain more knowledge. Someone who's been very, who's indeed very knowledgeable, to me, that was quite a flip of, of technique. And, you know, I was doing it this way, and it was the best surf ever, and now I've been doing it almost completely the opposite. And guess what? It's the best surf ever. So it's interesting. So always pay attention in terms of where the person's perspective is from, and I, I should you know, cover that up so you don't think I'm trying to sell you some things. Um, but it is important to kind of get an idea of where, you know, where you're coming from. So my objective today is not necessarily to outline the ultimate technique of how to collect stock with 5 6 piece tubing, because each of your situations is different. Each of our situations is different. Some of us have flat land, some of us have rolling topography, uh, some of us, uh, there's one tree in Ontario that has 120,000 trees all coming in one spot. There's other people that have 10 collection points for 200 tops. So there's a whole variety of things out there, and I can't possibly come up with one technique. Here's how you set up 5-6 piece tubing that works for everybody. But we can talk about some principles, you know, sort of as we go along, and, and sort of to give you a context of where our knowledge comes from. Uh, my son-in-law put together some data, kind of went back. We've been keeping records for a long time. Um, we've been using tubing since 1968, uh, remote pumping stations. I mean, after the first year, we realized we needed remote stations, so we started that in 69. And uh, we started keeping records, my wife and I, in terms of the number of trees and our yield in 1994. And I just wanted to post the graph to kind of show you. So, kind of steady along, our average yield from 94 through to about 2012 in our area um, of Ontario, we're sort of the northern limit of the range for maple. You know, when I go on a summer tour in 2008, and I go down to Waterloo, and you know we're getting three quarters of a liter at the top, and they're getting two liters, and I go and you know I'm looking around. And so the ground's flat, you don't have any snow, it's easy walking, and you make almost three times as much surf as I do. Like, what's the problem? And then Fred will say, "Well, but the, the pro at that time, well, the property is $10,000 an acre. Well, that's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a problem, right?" So but anyway, it gives you a perspective. So. From, from our standpoint, in terms of, and I talk further about what we do and why, why it works. Um, so, you know, for, you know, for 20 years, we thought the average production for our bush was about three quarters of a liter of maple syrup per top hole, and the best we would do is a liter. So in 2012, um, I had to redo a piece of bush and 4,000 tops. So I'm talking to the equipment representative, and he tops trees about two hours further north than we are. So I'm thinking that this is kind of good for us, you know, in the northern part of the limited range for maple, how good maple trees can grow, three quarters of a liter, that's pretty good, 
and the leaders, it's a phenomenal year. So I'm talking to the representative of Oregon Equipment, and 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 he's early on in his career with 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 the company, and most of the maple equipment manufacturers are based out of Quebec, as he was, and he was early on as a representative in Ontario, so his English wasn't the best. And so we're ta talking away, and, and, and I'm, you know, he's telling me about his farm that's two hours north of me, and he's getting, you know, and in Quebec they talk about pounds per tap, we use liters. So he's getting four and a half pounds per tap. So I'm doing the math, so my eyes are rolling, because I'm going, okay, that's 1.5 liters. So he could see the, he could, like, he could read it across my wrist, my forehead, that, you know, Bill thinks this is bullshit. <laughs> and it translated into French, so he could actually read it, and he's like, like, you don't believe me, do you? And I said, well, and then I explained, just as I explained to you, like, you're two hours from the north, never had more than a liter, which is three pounds, you're saying four and a half, you're trying to sell me a bunch of stuff, right? And uh, so, so he said, look, you hire my father and I, put the tubing in, and we'll prove it to you. So he put tubing in the fall of 2012. 2013, we had 1.4 liters per tap. We got over half our sap from a third of our trees. You know, we had put in a system with wet dry lines, higher vacuum. We did a whole lot of things in one year, so I'm not sure which one of them. I learned later which ones we had the most impact. High vacuum, wet dry, tech sort of almost everything. And so you can see what happened. You know, so, so from 2013, we only had one year below a liter, and a liter was the best we could ever do before. That's pretty encouraging stuff, you know, as a producer. So I don't have the research, you know, Abby speaks, I want to hear her, you know, her, her words and, and the, you know, the research and so on. So I don't have kind of scientific graphs to, to put in front of you, but I have sort of the, you know, our practical experience in terms of what we've seen. And yeah, we're blessed that Laurie has kept records over the years, so we can kind of demonstrate this two people like you so we can learn from each other. And, and so when we saw that in 2013, that's a real encouragement. Oh, we, need to, you know, we need to start paying attention to some, to, to some things. And so what are those things? Like, so, so I boil it down to three, you know, when you come away from a summer tour, you know, you're hoping for three, you know, maybe three key things that you take home. So <coughs> In a, perfect, in a perfect world, one of you somewhere along the line is going to remember all these three, and I'll be the guy that gave you the only ideas you remembered from the whole summer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So what are those three things? Well, high vacuum on the top of it. If we can talk about check valve, we can talk about transit tubing, we can talk about talk to all of these. These are the three. These, these are, if you can't put what your person is talking to you about into one of these three things, you're not thinking long enough. High vacuum at the top hole, number one. Number two, clean equipment, particularly at the top hole. The researchers say that about 70% of the bacteria that was in the stock flow comes from the spile. Okay, so that's why I say particularly at the top hole. So that's number two. The third thing is a good clean top hole. So Abby talked a bit about that as well. So those are the three basic things that we're talking about tubing installation. Again, I could get into talking about sap ladders and lifters and pump stations and all that, and we can kind of reference them as we go through. But because your situations are all different, I would prefer to leave you today with these three things and some discussion on these three things so that you get thinking about those as you design and work with systems in your own woodlot. That's, that's my objective today. My objective today is not to tell you, this is how you put up a main line, this is how you put up the three. My objective is to come back to these things sort of as, as we chat. Um, so these, you know, these, you know so as, as the last, you know, these things like check valves, wet drives, replacing taps every year, how we clean, you know, color of the tubing, precision toppers, you know, all that stuff. You know, there's certain tools we can use to help us tap. And people ask me, you know, do you use this or do you use that, whether it's a precision topper or a check valve, whatever, whatever. And, and on some things, I get kind of cute with people and say, you know, do you use this particular tool? And I'll say, well, that, that makes that particular task really proof but I prefer not to hire idiots to work on my sugar bush. So, you know, <laughs> you want people to think about things. You know, so you can give them the tools. There's, there's a place for tools. I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't, but, but, you know, you want people thinking and doing things. So, so let's tackle these three things sort of one at a time. Let's talk a bit about achieving high vacuum. Well, where you, well, one of the things you need is a pump. You need a pump 
that will achieve a good vacuum level, and it's kind of sized appropriately for your wood lot. You know, we used to talk um, about a, you know so many CFM per per tap and so on. Um, you know, and I, again, we can talk about those numbers here, but you can get that type of information from the North American Maple Surf Council manual. There are manuals online and so on that you can get kind of into that specifics. I think if I just bombard you with a whole bunch of numbers, they'll just become a bunch of numbers. So let's let's kind of just talk about the principle. So, you know, size the pump for the wood lot. Uh, then you need an effective collection network uh, that's adequately sized to get the vacuum back to the top. We often think about the system of how we get the stock to the tank. You know, you have to increase the size of the, of the main lines as you get close to the collection point, all that sort of thing. So sometimes we get focusing on how we're going to get the volume of liquid to the tank. Really, when you're thinking about collecting the most sap, you should be trying to think about how to get the air, how to get the vacuum to the, to the spot. Because that's how you're getting the sap. It's not about getting the sap to the tank. The sap will get there. If the vacuum, if the air is at the hole with vacuum, the sap will get to the tank. So as long as you have all the grade and so on, it'll get there. It's getting the vacuum, the air to the hole. So sometimes we have to think, sometimes we have to flip out of thinking backwards to become more effective. I use the analogy of a wood splitter. Knives of the wood splitters are made. Shove the wood through a knife and then it's on the ground and then you pick it up and put it back and then you split it again. The particular wood splitter I buy has a knife that goes through the wood, the wood stays there, I flip it over, it comes back through. My view is, the knife, you know, so whenever I look at things, I look at why is it designed to work backwards? A snowblower on a tractor, everybody has to turn around and back in. They make them that you can pull, they call it pull type, that's the type we have. So every time I see something and a task being done, I always ask, is that the right way to do it? Washing a barrel. People will put water in a barrel and they'll do what I call the barrel dance. They'll move the barrel through the water. So they're trying to keep the water in one place and move the barrel through it. But isn't it a lot easier to move water? So everything we think about, don't just do what Grandpa did or what the book said. Try and my message today is understand what you're trying to achieve. You know, and tubing, understand what we're trying to achieve in terms of that. So we need a way to verify that the vacuum has gotten to the far end of the system. So the third point on here is put as much thought and effort into measuring and figuring out how much vacuum you have out of the engine tubing as you do in terms of resources to create that vacuum. There's no point in having a $20,000 vacuum if there's leaks and so on and you don't know what the vacuum is at the, the far end. Do we have, do we have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, Bill, so um, we have a spot in our sugar bush where a couple of uh, lateral main lines kind of come together near the top of the hill. And my dad's been kind of musing over the last few years about whether we could, you know, run a dry line. Like we have a dry line going back there, but run the vacuum from that dry line to the back of those wet lines on the other end to get the vacuum to the back, you know, make sure we're getting the vacuum to the back of the bush. Have you ever heard anybody sort of doing that kind of thing, or did you see any problems with doing it? I'm not trying to clear on that. You're, you're just saying move a wet dry line. So we, we've got a wet dry li line going to the top of this hill, and okay. there's several other lateral wet lines going back there. Did and my dad's, that? yeah, my dad's saying, why don't we just run a run a dry line across the top and plug it in at the back of those other wet lines? You see an issue with that? You're getting more vacuum. You, it'll go where there's more vacuum, so you have to be careful if you just run the dry line. With that, it will work as a sap lifter. If it's frozen up or taking dry line beyond the wet, or to the end of the wet. I think it's to the end of the wet, because that's basically what you're doing with a dry line, isn't it? Yeah, you, take need, a, you need to have you need to have a place for the wet to go. Your wet and dry needs to be yeah. together. You can't just yeah. carry on with the dry because if, you have, if it has more vacuum, it'll it'll pull liquid up and just plug everything. So it's, it's not going to be effective without the wet and dry. They both have to pretty much should end at the same place. You can't just run another, run the dry further because with the idea that if it has the liquid's going to go where there's more vacuum, so if you're, you run the dry further, it's it's going to compete with where you you want the liquid to stay in the wet system. It's going to compete. With it. They need to be they need to end at the same place to be to be effective. We can talk about that more later. Yeah. Yeah. Like to draw a diagram on a piece of paper, it's hard to yeah. visualize. Um, 
The other point on this slide is, is uh, a way to have the pump running when needed. When we talk about, so I'm going to flip your thinking around a little bit on this because there's different thoughts out there in terms of, you know, some people say when you set, you know, so ideally not allowing the vacuum to get, to go, to get in the way of a morning thought. So there, the thought process is, there's a thought process where you turn the vacuum pump on at the start of the year once you're topped and you never shut it off until the season's done. There's other people will say, uh, run a vacuum and reduce the vacuum level um, to to a lower level as it freezes up at night because you know if you have a lower vacuum it won't freeze up as quickly sort of thing. So they have things on temperature. Some people say start your vacuum pump on temperature uh, because uh, um, you know you, you don't need to run at night but you need to have it running before it starts to, before it starts to run. Those sorts of things. I want you to think about that a little bit, I'm not, and, and, and I'll describe what we do a bit. Um, what we have found, what I found works is the best, is to have, there's, it's a matter of where you interact with the technology, it's a matter of, you know, you use technology to, to use the technology to do, to do lots of things, but it doesn't, not, not, doesn't necessarily, you'll never get technology doing everything, right? We don't have everything. So, so if you, for example, if you have a pump that turns on plus one, well, on a sunny day at plus one, the sap's probably flowing. But on a cloudy day, it might take plus five. So if you have that pump set to start on plus one, then that line is not gonna plow out because it's under vacuum until it gets maybe to plus eight because it's cloudy. So it takes longer to plow out because you've got it under vacuum already. So in our system, uh, what we do is, where we interact with the technology is we monitor the vacuum, we monitor the level of the tank. So we're at the first place where the tank is where sap flows in by gravity into a tank, we have a sensor that measures that level. And the tank, the vacuum pump that puts, activates vacuum on that system is not turned on until the tank has another one or two inches in it. So every morning we go in, I write down the levels of all of, and we have, we have a circuit house plus five remote pump stations. I write down all the tank levels. And we've experimented with this over the last few years where, oh, it's gotta be warm enough, we'll turn the pump on. And every time we do that, the one that we don't turn the pump on thaws out first. Every time. Without fail. And you turn you turn that off, wait 15 minutes until the tank level goes up, turn it back on, and you're going again. So my observation is that I share with this group is if you have that ability, again, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. You know, I, I explained this to one friend one time and he came back and told me it didn't work. It turned out that he had some lifters and so on in the in the system. So he was measuring at the wrong end. He was measuring where it finally came to the sugar house, waiting until some sap got there. Well, by the time the, the lifters and everything had started to work, the system was full of sap. So when he turned the vacuum pump on, he just got a, everything was flooded. It was, it was too late. So the measure where it kind of drops into the tank and then turn the system on. The other thing I want to put, so that's on a start. So let's flip to the, the shutdown of a vacuum system. When things start to freeze up, there's a suggestion you could lower the vacuum level. And that would work. And we have uh, six points where we collect. We all have variable frequency drives, except the last one because I realize we're not going to use it. We put that on so that we could do just that, so that we could idle the pump down and reduce the vacuum level as it froze up. We don't use it because sap will flow till about minus one and a half. In our, in our, this is an argument. I'm just speaking for, you know, check for your own book. So, about minus one and a half. Unless there's a leak. So the purpose of dropping the vacuum is to allow it to have leaks. And I'm, and, and our bush, like we're, we're trying to, we run our bush as a business, so every drop of sap means something. So I don't want, so I would prefer, like, yeah, I could reduce the vacuum and then we'd never know what a leak was. What we do is we go through, we've got a monitoring system. I talked about making sure you know, you know, a system to measure. So we go through, and as soon as one, when, as soon as the first one or two frees up, the, the, say a pump station has 30 ends, then we start writing them down, A22, A34. We'll write two or three down, and then maybe a half an hour later, we'll come down and we'll write another four. So the first three we wrote down is the first priority, and then the other ones are the second priority to look at for the next day. So rather than put in a system that, um, that reduces the vacuum level, we get out and fix the leak so we can leave it on and get more sap. That's, that's how we manage our system. So I just want you to you know, there's nothing wrong with some of these other ways of doing things, 
but you're, you are you are missing opportunities from our experience in our world. Again, it goes back to what you know when you listen to someone speak, you have to recognize where they're coming from. So in our situation, in our bush, that's what works best for us. It may or may not work for you, depending again whether you're lifters or this sort of thing. But just think about what you're doing in your life. It's really just those three things: vacuum levels, clean equipment, and clean hold and good hold. So let's talk a bit about what we can do while we're installing and cleaning and so on too. Um, so what can we do while we're, <coughs> while we're installing too? We can keep the laterals you know, as short and straight as possible. Uh, some use what they call a stride for five, so sort of no more than five smiles before you get into a main line. Uh, you can use the slope to add, help add additional natural vacuum where, where it's practical. So in high slope areas, um, you know, on high slope area, you may run your main lines sort of parallel to the slope and then use the slope more in the small and in the 5 6 inch tubing sort of thing. So straight and as, put as much of the slope, because the, the vacuum, the artificial vacuum will work well in the main lines. It has a harder time getting to the little lines. So if you can orchestrate your system so that you're using the, the natural slope as much as possible on the smaller tube, the smaller the tubing, the, the more advantage it is to use the natural slope of the, of the system to help those because the pump can only do so much. Utilize uh, third point talks about utilizing wet and dry systems. People kind of use a, a rule of thumb of sort of a thousand feet that, that when, the, when the tube, when the sap and air leaves the small by sixteenths tubing into a main line, whether it's three quarter or one inch, kind of a thousand feet at two percent slope is, is sort of enough and then you should be getting either to the tank or to some sort of wet dry system that will separate the liquid in the air. You know, when you're putting those mains uh, like parallel to the slope on the side of the hill, are you just putting the laterals on the one side? And well, I'm, I'm describing what the technique is, yeah. and what the technique is in this case is a little bit different than what we, than what we do. And the reason for that is there's a cost to doing that because you only have laterals on one side. That's right. But on a larger operation like ours, to have a whole lot of main lines that are just at the sort of the one or two percent slope, just sort of at the minimum, creates a lot. Like we have 35 kilometers of main lines, and if they were all at one percent slope, as soon as there's a little bit of an issue, you've got slugs of sap. So we do not do it that way. That's the best. That's the best practice, and you'll get the most. You get more sap that way. We don't do it that way because of cost. And because of patrol, if we, you know, so, so, so we we do more of a herringbone where the where the. Uh, I flip to the next. So this is what you, what we just talked about. So this is the, the blue line going up is the is the main line, and then at a, like the wet dry main system, the 401. And then the green lines are the main lines that are carrying both sap and air, and I go along the slope and then come to the wet dry. So the wet dry goes up the slope. Doesn't matter how steep it is because the liquid's in one line, the air is in the other. The, the green lines going across are at 2%, and then we use the slope of the hill to get the most drop into the small tube. So if you've got a densely populated stand, if you're running 70 tops an acre or more, and you know you've got lots of yield, and you've got you know you don't have 50,000 tops where you you know you can keep your main lines all nice and tight, straight, and staked, and all that, then you'll optimize your yield doing this. We don't do this, again, for those two reasons, because of the cost, but mostly because of the patrol. You know, we feel that anything we invest in cost will come back to us. So if we were confident that it was going to give us more, great. But, but uh, you know, we're, again, this is getting into the technicalities of the system. The bottom line is, you know, how much backing are you getting, are you getting back? Um, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not going to speak a lot today because we don't have enough time to get into sort of ladders and lifters. There's a lot of people here that, that have more experience with ladders and lifters and working on flat land. Um, we tried an experiment, a very expensive experiment that worked fortunately. Uh, we had a wet dry system and we uh, put it out, we had 2% slope on a two and a three inch line going out underground. And then the last, for 1400 feet, that was fine. And then for the last 1300 feet, we only had five feet of elevation. So we only had 0 0.3 to 0.4% of slope. And so we left the size large, two and a three inch, and guess what? We're getting good vacuum at the other end. 
We're not, we're not, we didn't lose any more than half an inch of vacuum, even though we were only at 0.3 of a percent. So we broke the rules again. But we didn't break the rule of vacuum, you know, high vacuum. That's it. That's all you need. You know, if you can, if you can go up, you know, bless you. If you can, if you can, if you can go uphill and get vacuum, I'd like to know how you did it. But if you can do that, great. Because that's what you're after. Like, don't get wound up in, uh, well, someone those said you've got to have at least 3% slope or so. You have to have good vacuum at the tree, period. So when you're putting in wet dry systems or any systems, um, you always need to think, whenever you're doing anything, you always need to think about how you're going to maintain things. So just, just sort of an example, if you're putting wet dry system in, uh, this is what we favor. They call it the whip, kind of a whip system. There's a manifold system like this one, and then there's a whip system where, you know, the, the small tubing goes into the main line, and as it gets close to the wet dry, then the liquid goes through a, through a stainless steel T, liquid drops, and then there's a whip going high, so the air goes to the, the upper line. And yeah, we, you know, we've tried some of this stuff with plastic fittings, and that's always ends up in one. The one that breaks is usually the hardest one to get to. It usually breaks when it's plus five and snowing, and the snowshoeing is that like that, and it's nine o'clock at night. So, um, so then there's a like there's a manifold type system that shows in this, and some you will see some people use a manifold system where they have the manifold between the wet and dry. I, I like this system better. You'll see how the manifold is away from the wet and dry. So the wet, picture the, the, the main lines moving around in, the, in a massive storm. And if you've got the two lines tied tight together, there is no wiggle room. So we don't use this system. We use the whip system because it has even more flexibility and, and is less prone to need any maintenance. But some people do like to use those. So I'm not, I'm not advocating one thing over another. All I want you to go away from here is with those three key points. The rest of it, you can go to the North American Manual, you can talk to your reps and all that sort of thing. But uh, if you can figure out how to do it differently, it's high vacuum, um, a clean hole, and clean equipment. But this is just an example of, uh, of how we put our posts in because I, I don't, you know, I see it done this way by people, but a lot of people I don't, and I haven't seen a better system. So see your posts. A piece of what they call all round, so the little strapping with the holes in it, wraps it around the wire, puts a vise against the wire, and then a roofing screw into the post. Roofing screw as opposed to a screw nail, because then you can use your electric nut driver and back screws off and adjust things and so on. And posts are just on top of the ground. The wire holds the post up and the post holds the wire up. They love each other. There's no need to be digging holes and carrying on. So anyway, just a quick a sort of a, a sort of a trick tip as we go by. So what, else, what, what can we do when we're installing sort of additional items, uh, sort of a list of items to go through when we're talking about installation? We can utilize fittings and techniques to eliminate leaks. Um, we can move towards extractors that remove staff without allowing air tanker, so things like electric extractors. Uh, we can, and, and another thing is, think about how, you, whenever you're installing, think about how you're going to clean things. We'll be talking about cleaning shortly. Uh, many producers, as I spoke to, use one-inch main lines regardless of the number of tops. We use one-inch main lines. Uh, you know, utilize remote collection points so that you can maximize the slope to get your to get the most vacuum. Try and do your best not to sacrifice vacuum to make your life easier if it's going to mean because it's going to mean you're going to get less sap. So if you've got to sacrifice vacuum to run ladders and lifters and so on, um, that may be okay in some cases. But if you're trying to maximize the amount of sap you're going to get. Just make sure, however you do that, that it doesn't compromise vacuum that's at the top hole. That's, that's a, a key. So if we talk about what we can do when installing, let's uh, talk about what we can do in the south front. So we've already talked a bit about the first point. Run vacuum at all times when the sap is flowing. So it's not about, because some people will turn, at night will turn the vacuum off. Well, there's not, you know, it's gas powered. There's not a whole lot of sap coming. Hardly worth the gas, or it's hardly worth electricity. Let's just shut it off. It's not about we talked about it earlier. It's not about the amount of sap you're getting on a per minute or per hour basis when you've got that pump on. It's also about that clean, cleanliness aspect. Like keep those three things in mind. If I turn that off, then there's a risk of sap going back towards that hole, and that's going to affect my flow later in the season. You know, on on that warm week, on the Thursday of the warm week. I sent a note to a friend of mine. We were we made 10 barrels of surf that day. I sent a note to a friend of mine in the same in the same geographic area, and his bush had stopped running two days before that. 
probably because you know at night you turn things off and so on. You know, if you, you have to think about those things as you're setting up. You know, we you know we spend a lot of time. We've got electricity to all our pump stations and so on, so that we can. You know, when I saw what was happening back in 2013, then I went on a mission to get power back everywhere, so I could. You know, I, we're not monitoring to be coming. We're gonna eventually have the ability to turn things on. We get eight stuff. Um, you know, and second point: reduce uh, the ability for bacteria to back in. Again, the impact is more important for a few minutes. Third point, get the vacuum on as soon as you can, but don't turn the vacuum on if it's going to impact when things are going to thaw out. Because you got to remember, that yes, there's a panic to run the vacuum at the end of the day, right until the sap stops to stop the bacteria from coming in and slowing things down. But at the start of the day, there's no panic. It's going to start running. The only panic is you want to get it going to increase the amount of sap you get into your tank. It's not really as much of a crucial item for the bacteria to affect the, to affect the tree. So you have to play with your own system. We find that you know generally we, it's best if we don't turn the vacuum on until the ends. Until if we turn the vacuum on and more and you know sort of more than a third of them are still froze up, it's too early. You can allow if there's 30 ends of main lines of 30 of those sensors. If, if if 10 of them are froze up, it might be a bit early. But if you only have two or three, you might be able to leave it on. But generally, if we turn it on and there's a few still froze up, we turn back off again. And then, you know, verifying that the vacuum at the releaser, you know, is, is close to what the pump can do. So if a pump, if your pump is able to do 26 inches, and you turn the, when you turn the valves off, you want to get as close to that as you can when the system's running. Because every time you drop, this is something you learn if some of you have a monitoring systems and some of you don't. So this is something you learn when you have a monitoring system I'll share with some of you, with all of you, in case some of you don't have one, is that it's not a linear, linear in your relationship between uh, vacuum drop and, and at the at the pump and at the far end. So if the vacuum drops an inch at the uh, because of a leak, drops an inch at the pump, it may drop an inch and a half at the back end. But the next inch might result in two or three inches, and then the next inch might be five inches at the far end. So you know, three inches at the pump might be 15 inches at the far end along your line. So it's very not but it's not a linear relationship. So when you're you know, for those of you who don't have a monitoring system, we'll get one, first of all. But if you don't have a monitoring system, don't assume, you know, that, that, that well, I'm just down an inch. You're just down an inch of the pump, but if you've got a good pump, it may be making up for all of those leaks. And so that's something that we've really picked up on. It's really brought home over the last few years with the monitoring. Um, when the stops like, okay, so continue. Um, I think we've talked about most of these. Uh, each night as it goes to green, and then turn down the vacuum levels, keep it running, and make note of where things are. Observe, uh, observe your vacuum levels if you've got a monitoring system. Observe your vacuum levels at the far end of your lines on low flow days versus high flow days. A low flow day, there's not as much sap interfering with the transfer of of the air and vacuum, so you may have better vacuum on the low flow days. And you think, well, on the high on the high flow days, not to worry, we get lots of sap anyway. But you may be missing opportunities. I mean, that's when the tree's ready to give you sap, and, and just at that time you're turning the vacuum down because your main lines being aren't sized enough or tight enough to get adequate vacuum levels. So, so just because you're getting lots of sap, if you're interested in turning this into a business and maximizing your yield, don't stop because that's that's when you. It's just like when you're trying to win a fight and the guy goes down, and you're, oh, he's down now. You might get back up again. So, you know, when 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 you got it there, the sap's there. Go we'll grab more. That's the time to get. That's not the time to back off and say we got lots. Yes, we're trying to maximize the yield. You make your sugar house as efficient as possible, not so that you can sit in a wheel in a wheelchair in a, in a lazy boy chair, but rather so that you can get out to the bush. So, you know, I'm 62. I don't move as fast as I used to. We try and make the sugar house as efficient as we can, so that on those, so some of those days I can actually get out and into the bush and have a look and see what's going on and help out that exercise. Um, so I. I was going to make a kind of a comedian chart where, where you know, an inverse line where the where the yield is inversely proportional to the body mass index of the people that are walking. <laughs> <laughs> the thinner the guy that's out there, the quicker you can move. The, the, the more leaks you're going to find, the better you can do. Um, compare your yields per tap to your most diligent and truthful neighbors. Uh, I've got a, a friend who taps 1,400 trees. He's very, you know, he's very, uh, very up on uh, on his yield. So we feel. If we have ten times as many trees and our yield per tap is as good as his, 
we're good. We're happy. And, uh, so we work on that. Uh, but I mentioned that we should fix all the leaks during the presentation. I did. Let's talk a bit about cleaning. I'm going to keep things moving because I haven't got too many more slides. I want to pick a little bit of cleaning. And because uh, I have some, might be slightly different perspectives in front of this. So we have a tremendous advantage in Canada in being able to use the iso alcohol to clean it. And you can learn a lot on your tubing installation from the cleaning aspect when you're using vacuum to clean. Because if you, if you, um, when you're cleaning with, with alcohol, the normal procedures go to the tree furthest from the main line and then work to the main line, right? Well, if, if you pull that last, the, every spot on that line should be close to having the same amount of zip when you pull the spot out of the tree. So if you pull the spot out of the tree right beside the main line and it's just instant, maximum vacuum, that's because there's nothing, there's nothing obstructing that. If you go, you know, but if you go to your, the tree you're going to start with, the one furthest from the main line, and you pull that out, and you've got to wait for the vac for the liquid to evacuate, uh, the to sour sap to evacuate to the main line before you put your alcohol in, that's a problem. You are losing an opportunity. When the sap's running, that line's full of sap, and that sap that vacuum cannot transfer through there. So you're either below the main line, or you don't have enough slope, or you've got too many lines, or there's too much twist, all those sorts of things. You can learn a lot about whether you've got things set up right. Um, by observing what's happening when you're doing the cleaning. And it's important to pay attention to that. You know, how many taps per layer, uh, per, per lateral. Um, we talked about striving for five. Uh, a little bit more about cleaning. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, practice that we use. So a spile is where the researchers tell us that 70% of the bacteria that going to close the spile comes from. So again, I'm not going to tell you how to do things, but I'm going to challenge you to think about what you do. So my question to you, how many people here use vacuum to clean with? Pull up. Okay. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you how many people, but I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer this one. How many people take this spile out of the tree, put alcohol in it to clean it, and then reach down to a T, and just after you've cleaned this, suck all the dirt out of the T back into there, and then shove this into the dirty T. There's a few people. We stopped doing that. I don't know, I don't know research, no numbers to show you, but intuitive, that's why I say, you need to think. Like, sometimes you, could, you can do the research, and you know, people go to talks, and they'll travel for hours to listen to a particular speaker, and then they take notes, and they can do it that way. So, no. Just listen, think, and understand for yourself, and you'll you'll be far better off. So I've thought a lot about this, and I thought, why would I do that? Why would I do that? First of all, why would I use a black or blue spile? You know, like color of spile is important. Like why would I use a white one so I can see if it's dirt? First of all, that's number one. Is it if you can visually see there's bacteria there, then you know to put another one. And you know, well, why, do you, why would we use it? Why would we use anything other than white? Well, a darker one, sitting in the sun, warm up sooner, the sap's going to close sooner. We're going to get more sap. Hold on, let's go back to the thinking thing here, right? Okay, so the black spile thaws out. Has the tree thawed out? No. Black spile thawed out, and the black spile has thawed out a bit, little bit of tissue around the hole. So that little part of the tree is warm. A little bit of sap comes. But it's, but it's warmed up there and bacteria is growing. So you got a little bit of sap that started the thing. The tree didn't give you any sap, it's just what thought it around the hole. Bacteria started to grow. In the end, my thought is the little bit of sap you might have got from the black spile at the start of the morning is, is a lot less than, than, you're gonna, than you would get if you could keep the tree from, from growing bacteria and walling off the area and slowing it slow down later in the year. So our thought is, use a white spile, we don't really want any sap until the tree thaws out because that's when the sap really comes. You know, you can, you can take a blow source of the spile, but you're not going to get more sap until the whole tree thaws out. So that's why, you know, a white or clear, some sort of spile that you can see whether it's dirty or not, and then um, take it out, put our alcohol in, and put it in something, there's many different, there's many different, every manufacturer has some sort of a cap. So we, uh, in our book, um, carry these when, 
we're uncapping. So we take this file out, put the alcohol in, put the cap on, flip it to the line, and then it's there. The next year we just pull it out, cap, we take these. We actually, some people leave these in the bush. We actually carry these out and clean them separately at the, at the sugar house. The first year we did this, we brought the first couple of bags in and uh, said to Lori, you know, can you help it? Because she has some mobility issues, so she gets tagged with a lot of the camp doobies. And so, can you clean these? So I came back and a half an hour later, and they were out on the counter, and she was this, there was this brush. And I said, honey, eventually there's going to be 18,000 these coming to you. <laughs> so we need to better a different method, right? So, so what we do with these is we put them in a washing machine. We have a washing machine at the sugar house that's never seen so it's just for sap filters. And we use that for these things. On a smaller scale, if you decide you want to try this technique, on a smaller scale, you could dump 100 or 50, or however many caps you have, you could dump them in a bucket of water, switch them around with a, with, a, with a pole, dump that water, put fresh water, do it again, just do it a few times to clean these out. Uh, and then just check them to make sure they're not dirty. Like it doesn't make, you know, well here's the example. So there's the, there's this file in the cupboard and there's the, there's the, the cob that was in, I went back to my book a couple of days ago. Uh, and look, so there's a no example of some of the dirt that's in, that you'll see in a, in a spot that you're, you're trying to avoid. Um, so what do you do? So, so then the, quickly, we're, you're watching time? Yeah, I'm watching time. I've only got about five minutes. Uh, so this is about the second last slide, I think. Um, so think about for yourself. What do you do when your seed yields up? Would you consider additional thing in your woodlot? Make sure you bigger. Um, you know, thinning can be the first thing you do. We usually do the thinning before we install, and, and we are now going. We're using this increased yield to reduce the number of taps. So now our bush, um, we have a little bit more to do, but but uh, we're about 95% of the way towards a single tap. So we're using the additional yield to um, reduce the impact on our trees. That's why I was asking Abby about the effects of vacuum because people say, oh, you put high vacuum on. I had that question from a producer. So you put, I don't do high vacuum because of tree health. And my answer to him was, I'm using high vacuum because of tree health. So that I can reduce the number of taps. Um, there's additional resources out there. So if you want to get into the specifics of your situation, I encourage you to look at the North American Maple Cert manual. I encourage you to look at the New York State tubing and vacuum system uh, notebook that they have. There's lots of good online resources. Our local put together a video that talks about pump stations and so on. Uh, good to go and have a look at that. So there's some additional resources to look at. Back to the final slide, back to those three points. High vacuum, clean hole, clean equipment. That's all there is to making a lot of cert. That's it, there's three things. You can get wound up in color main lines, color of the file, shape for this and all that, manufacture, those are the three things. That's it. Any questions that might pertain to the whole group? We have about two or three more minutes before you all have to go. If there's no questions that would pertain to the whole group, I'm happy to entertain any other ones. What's your opinion on check valves? What's my take on check valves? Yeah. We, we had check valves on one pump station, and when we put the next pump station in, we were about to put them in because of the high yield. We didn't. We went to the white soft files, and we had the same yield. It's, it's about, the check valve is to keep the bacteria from the hole, and you can achieve the same thing by keeping the vacuum on until four minutes on the house and checking your leaks. And we find that the check valve, in some cases, we were actually seeing bacteria, even though I put new ones in every year, we were seeing bacteria in the little ball on the fingers and going, holy shit, like, it's supposed to stop that, it's actually encouraging it. So, it's clean, our holes are cleaner, our soft flow is the same without them. And then it's less hassle, because we have to hire people to help us tap, it's less uh, when we change them, we change the spiral key drop line, and we have many that are that are that we, we haven't got all of them changed yet. We think maybe if we've got stuff that's seven years old, they're fine. They're white. We look at them and go, "Well, that's fine." We'll, 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 we look at them and they're white and they're fine. So uh, probably go in five years. years. Probably coincides with the uh, length of time we've been using alcohol to clean. Yeah, I, we I think, think alcohol is a positive, but at the positive cleaning effect on your drop lines, you might be able to get a couple more years. Out. It is. Uh, we, we think. I think what we're going to end up with is I've been talking about this: whether we need to replace the spiles every five years. So after couple year five, year ten, and then when the tubing's done, we think we might be okay to just do it after ten years if the yields are still good, and that way we replace. The, the tea that sometimes gets, we have to tap in the cold weather because of the 
number of trees we have. So by replacing the T in the spile after 10 years, we get another five years before the whole tubing's done, and we can tap in the colder weather. Because after 12 years, they start getting brittle. So it's not about cleanliness, it's more about the brittleness of the T that are stimulating us to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, question over here. I was going to ask about uh, like disposable uh, tips for the spirals. I, that's that's what I'm using currently. What's in your hand right now? But it, someone had mentioned that uh, having a, a disposable tip, tip that goes in to throw away every year. Have you experimented with that? Huh? No, we we felt that the check valve was was equivalent to that. And like I say, we didn't really see any difference with the check valve versus versus the white spirals on we kept kept the vacuum on. So I'm not saying it's not a good thing to do in, in, in different cases situations. Just relating back to those three things. If that's what you need to do to help you keep clean equipment and easier, we feel we can do it this way by making sure that we use the stray cap to keep them clean and then throwing out the ones that are white and keeping the vacuum on. But it's back to those three things. If that's what you need to do to get there. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for sharing all your